This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. For animal lovers, by animal lovers. Hey, Brian from Snake Bites here. I've traveled to San Jose, California to check out For Goodness Snakes. There's some really interesting animals, and it's going to be a little bit of a lesson of how you can run a collection. You're watching Snake Bites. So Brian, tell me a little bit, how long have you been breeding reptiles? I'd say about 20 years. About 20 Something years. Like now did you start with pythons or what was your kind of first love of reptiles? I started out with colubrids. I went uh, from colubrids, I bred and sold colubrids for about 10 or 12 years and saw a photograph of a pied. And at the time, pies were selling for 25000 each. And I just, it was like, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And went out and bought a couple of male uh, het pies and mm -hmm. started my project from breeding male pie, male het pies to normal. Right. It's, it's a great way to start, you know, out if you get a het male of something, it's, it's a long process, yeah. but you get a male, you breed it to normals, you get 50% hets, you raise them up, you breed them back, and instead of spending 25 grand, you might spend 1500 to get into a project, so yeah. it's, uh, it's something that uh, it's, it's a lot of people don't realize that that's a great way into recessive. Yeah, at the time, the male uh, het pies were selling for $1,000. Oh, each. there you go. Yeah, so 25 for a pie or 1000 for a pasta. Takes a while longer, but hey, the end result was the same, right? Right, oh yeah. So people ask me all the time, how do I get into snake breeding and making it more than just a hobby, but maybe even make a few bucks? Well, I love the fact that Brian has an interesting take on this. I always say when it comes to business, there's really three things. There's quality, there's price, and then there's service. Let's face it, if you want to be the cheapest guy on the block, you're probably not going to be in business too long. And everyone has relatively good service if they stay in business for any length of time. So what Brian has decided to do is really focus on quality. And this piebald is a great example of what he's trying to do by specifically line breeding for certain traits. Now, what he's trying to do is get the really cool patterned animals, like these multiple stripes here down the back, almost a patternless animal with in the actual coloration and he's also breeding for really bright colors like yellow to come through and it's really an amazing animal and it all started with this patriarch right here but a lot of his offspring are showing this exact trait and again it's really cool when you start breeding for quality that way when there's 10 different people that you want to buy a pie from who are you going to choose? You're going to choose a guy like Brian that has really pioneered this beautiful, bright pie. Now just take a look at that animal. Now let's face it, this is 80 or 90% white. There's not a whole lot of pattern, but look at the pattern that is here. Now that is one gorgeous animal. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few more pies. Brian Gundy got extremely lucky and produced two clown pies out of four eggs this year. Being a double recessive, what are the actual odds of producing one? A, one in eight, B, one in 16, or C, one in 32? Go ahead and answer down below in the comments and check back later in the show to see if you have the right answer. For this week's Reptile Report Spotlight, we'll be highlighting Arachna boards. Go ahead and check out the URL down below or click on the link in the description. The thing that's so amazing about pies is the variability within the actual gene itself. And I tell you, everybody is a little bit different. Some people love the high white animals, other people like the low white animals, and Brian really has a pretty good variety of these animals. I really want to talk about what he's going for too. Again, he's trying to do something more than just the normal pied, and you can certainly start to see it even in this animal here. I would say this animal would be considered a relatively low white one, maybe 40% white or so, but again, the thing that's really amazing is that it's extremely bright, lots of yellow, lots of orange in it, and again, that same pattern, which is that kind of striping down it. It's just a really gorgeous animal. And again, he's kind of working towards that goal, but his favorite animal that's kind of a holdback right now is an animal that certainly caught my eye too. And I tell you, every time I've ever seen a piebald, I'm always in love with them. And I've talked about it so many times, how pies were really kind of the animal that got me into ball pythons, but it was before piebalds were ever produced and actually proven genetic. This happens to be probably the perfect example for my personal opinion on what a pie should look like. 
right about 50%. But again, this isn't a normal pied really because it's really bright compared to the majority of pieds you see. Now all pieds tend to have a little bit of wacky pattern in the normal part, but these guys are almost like yellow bellies. It's just like the, what they used to call the pumpkin pies because they're just so orange and so yellow. But just take a look at that gorgeous animal there. Again, it almost reminds me of a double recessive, but again, this is just a piebald that is being line bred for a specific trait, which is basically the striping and the color, which is pretty cool, isn't it? And then, of course, you went from that 40% to 50%. I want to show you one now that's getting a little bit more high white. Now again, high white animals seem to be the more sought after animals when it comes to piebalds. I personally like them with a little bit more pattern, but again, look at how cool that is. Now that's certainly approaching, got to be 80 plus percent. Now that's one gorgeous snake. But again, to me personally, without the pattern, it's not as attractive of an animal. But so many people love the high white animals, and this one is getting close. And again, you can see the quality is there with that orange and yellow pigment. And let's go ahead and take it to the next level right here. This would be what the creme de la creme of high whites are right here. This one is certainly a 90% white animal. Look at it. It's almost like a leucistic with a normal head. And what's really cool is it has this little orange blotch on the back. And I tell you what, piebalds are pretty polymorphic. But this brings up an interesting topic. And Brian thinks that there's a chance that his line could actually be producing more high whites than most other lines, or at least his line is producing more high whites. It's really an interesting topic. We're not sure if it's completely random, or maybe there is a specific line that's producing higher white animals, just like these guys. Either way, these things are absolutely gorgeous. And I gotta show you one other pie project that's absolutely ridiculous. So before I show you the pied, I'm going to show you an animal that has always been very dear to my heart. And I think you're going to get an idea of the actual pied I'm going to show you. And this is, of course, a clown ball python. Now let's just start by saying that I brought in one of the very first clown ball pythons from Africa. And it was pretty awesome. I can remember that day like it was yesterday, going to the airport. But this is before you could ship them to your door. And I remember opening up the bag and seeing a clown ball python and absolutely just blew me away. Well, here we are years and years later, and this happens to be a clown that's possible head for piebald. But I tell you what, even though it's only 66% possible head, you can certainly see some marker traits in this. Look at all the white that's coming through the belly. This has to be a 100% het pied clown. But again, a possible head is a possible head until you prove it out. And here's another example of another possible head that's showing some expression of the pie gene. Just take a look at this back right here where you can actually see what they call a ringer, which is more or less just a, a white blotching on it. Now, for whatever reason, a lot of het pieds have ringers that basically are just marker traits for the recessive trait of piebaldism. So there's a good chance that this is a recessive clown that's also het for a recessive piebald. And again, when you're talking about double recessives, it's a long shot. So get this, guys. This is absolutely crazy. Brian bred double het to double het. And out of about a six egg clutch, that lucky sucker produced two of these guys right here. That's right. Just take a look at how gorgeous that is. This is a clown pied. Oh my God, I love clowns and I love pies. Probably my two favorite morphs of simple recessives. And to see them together is absolutely stunning. Just take a look at that little cute monkey right there. And how lucky is that? One of the coolest things about my job when I get to run around and meet people is to hear the interesting stories and more importantly, the backstories about certain mutations. This one is a pretty cool story. Now, Brian has always had that philosophy, get the coolest and most beautiful animal so that your quality is incredible. So he actually picked out the best Mojave he could a long time ago from the Sutherlands, who was producing the very first Mojaves. This little guy is hissing at me, and he doesn't scare me whatsoever. But again, you can kind of just see that it was a really beautiful Mojave. This isn't the actual one, but it's one of the offspring of the gold blush animals. And again, 
Most Mojaves are much, much darker than this and you don't see nearly the amount of yellow and kind of that blushing look, hence the name Gold Blush. Now when he started producing them, he was getting some really incredibly gorgeous Mojaves, but he didn't really think too much of it other than the fact that, hey, when you breed a really beautiful snake, you're going to get more beautiful snakes. And look at this snake here. This is absolutely gorgeous. This is a great example of a gold blush Mojave. I tell you, it's so unusual that it almost reminds me more of a lesser than a Mojave, but this is actually 100% Mojave. Now, when a person bred a gold blush Mojave to a GHI, it produced something completely different than the normal GHI Mojaves. And that's when he realized he had something more than just a really pretty Mojave. So let's go ahead and take a step back and look what a gold blush itself probably looks like. So a normal gold blush, or at least what we think it's gonna look like, is something like this. And when Brian showed it to me, he kinda asked my opinion if I thought that it was an actual gold blush. And I tell you what, it certainly isn't a normal ball python, I can tell you that much. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the orange dream, but something completely different. Now, you can just kind of see that it's much more clean than a normal ball python, and there's just tons of gold coming through in that kind of orangey look as well. Other than that, I don't see any really major thing. I mean, certainly the belly has a lot more pigment in it. Um, I can definitely see that this is probably the actual single gene, whatever is paired up to that Mojave gene. Now the bigger question is, is it recessive? Is it co-dominant or is it dominant? And right now we really don't know. We just know that it's making some really beautiful, clean animals. So I love it when you have a project like this that still have some secrets to unlock. But let's go ahead and look at some of the offspring from these guys, because I'm telling you what, they are absolutely gorgeous. So this gold blush gene is really interesting to me because it's what I consider an enhancing gene, which basically just means it makes mutations look that much better, which is really cool. Take a look at this crystal that has gold blush in it. And you can tell crystals are gorgeous animals, but they certainly never look this good. Now a crystal is actually produced by breeding a Mojave to a special, which are both kind of co-dominant mutations, but in actuality, it doesn't work the same way as breeding two co-dominants together because it's actually what they call allelic, which means that they basically share the same protein on an allele. So if you breed a crystal to a normal, you're never gonna get a crystal, unlike if you were breeding two co-dominants together and you bred it to a normal, one in four babies would come out the double co-dominant animal. In this case, if you bred a crystal to a normal, you get 100% either Mojave or specials. Never any normals and never any crystals. Regardless, this crystal is really ridiculous looking, but this is only the beginning. I tell you what, once you get that gold blush into things, it just really pops. Brian showed me this animal here, and I tell you what, there's no way I would have ever thought that this was just a pastavi, which is a pastel Mojave but of course with the gold blush gene. So it's essentially a double co-dominant animal, which is pastel and Mojave, and then the gold blush gene added into it. And just take a look at that animal. I'm telling you, my pastavis don't look like this, but I certainly want them to look like this. This happens to be a gold blush super pastel Mojave, or basically what they would call a gold blush super pastavi, which just basically means that the pastel gene has got both of the expressions which makes it a super and it just kind of brightens it up a little bit fades it out a little bit and this is one pretty cool animal and then he continued to breed them into different mutations that just make things super super cool like take a look at this right here this is a firefly gold blush now what i find interesting about this animal is the fact that this is kind of the first gold blush mutation that doesn't have Mojave in it, yet it reacts the exact same way by uber cleaning it up and making it even bright more yellow. That tells me that this gene is able to be plugged into almost every mutation and it's going to continue to enhance the color and pattern and make some incredible animals. And this is just essentially a double animal with the gold blush on it, much like the pastavi. But then you start getting into other stuff like this guy here, the gold blush fire Mojave. And again, the fire gene is co-dominant. Of course, when you breed two fires together, you get the black-eyed blue cystic. And of course, the Mojave is 
codominant as well. When you breed those together, you get a blue eye type of leucistic. So it's kind of cool when you mix two white producing snakes together, but with the gold blush gene, it just looks completely different than a fire Mojave. Again, just look at all that color and that cleanliness of them. But I tell you what, the creme de la creme is when you start mixing all of them together and just take a look at this animal right here. Whew, that thing is literally on fire. This is basically what they call a firefly Mojave gold blush, which is pastel, fire, Mojave, and gold blush all together. But wow, just take a look at that. And look at the sides, how much floating pattern it has. I tell you, this thing is ridiculous. And if it is a co-dominant mutation and there's a super gold blush, you can only imagine what this animal is going to look like. I tell you, I love it when I kind of discover how cool a new gene is. So again, when people ask me, I want to be a snake breeder, whether it's just for a hobby or maybe even a profession, but how can I compete with the big names in the business? I think this is a great example of how you do that. Brian has really chose the quality of the animals over anything else. That way, when someone walks up at a reptile show or sees your website, they're gonna see an animal that's really beautiful. And that's not to say that the big guys like me aren't producing beautiful animals, but certainly when you can really specify the quality in everything you do, things really show through. You can certainly take a look at this beautiful killer bee. It's just amazingly clean and beautiful. Again, the patterning is perfect, the whiteness is perfect. You can tell that there's really been attention to detail when it comes to which animals he wants to breed and ultimately which animals are for sale on his website or at a reptile show. When I got into snakes it was all about producing the most the prettiest snake I can produce so it was just always about selective breeding so I hope this is a great example to you guys that are aspiring to be breeders that hey if you pick something like great quality animals you can compete with anybody take a look at this animal now he's really a special animal for a number of reasons his name is Buzz and he's a black and white Argentine tegu and what a gorgeous little guy he is. But he's really a great ambassador for educating kids. Now, Brian breeds snakes, but for close to a decade, he's been going out with animals like Buzz here and teaching the youth of our world how amazing animals are. And ultimately, no matter how many snakes you produce or sell for that matter, Raising the next generation of animal lovers is far more important. It's just pretty cool to be able to hang out with a little guy like Buzz here, knowing that so many kids go home at the end of the day after Brian gives an amazing educational presentation, and they talk to their parents about how cool these animals are. It's really one of these things that's kind of fun for children of all yeah, ages. Absolutely. And it's just amazing, to, and as you see all the time, amazing to see the transformation if you can do your job right as the educator and help these people understand that these animals are just as gentle as puppies. Tell you what, I don't know about you guys, but this has been an amazing experience. Kind of get to know Brian a little bit, seeing his amazing animals, and really being appreciative of the work he does for the future. Hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I have. Brian Gundy got extremely lucky and produced two clown pies out of four eggs this year. Being a double recessive, what are the actual averages to produce one? If you said B, 1 in 16, you're 100% correct. Good job. So there it is. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. What an incredible collection. And if you want any more information about Brian Gundy and for goodness snakes, go ahead and click on the link in the description. And as always, I was Facebooking and tweeting my way through it. So make sure to follow me over at Snake Bites TV. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. Hi, I'm Peter Birch, an Aussie bloke who loves wildlife. My respect for nature started when I was a young boy in rural New South Wales. Since then, it's exploded into an obsession. New episodes every Thursday, only on Animal Bites TV.